If you're here, then you already know who she is. Lydia Tarr is many things. As a conductor, Tarr began her career with the Cleveland Orchestra, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, until she had last arrived here at our own New York Philharmonic. In 2013, Berlin elected Tarr as its principal conductor, and she's remained there ever since. Lydia Tarr has also written music for the stage and screen. She is one of only 15 EGOTs, meaning those who have won all four major entertainment awards. Thank you for joining us, Maestro. Thank you. How's the writing going? Not so well. I keep hearing something. Schopenhauer measured a man's intelligence against his sensitivity to noise. Do you ever find yourself overwhelmed by emotion? Yes. Yes, that does happen. You want to dance the mask, you must service the composer. You've got to supplement yourself, your ego, and yes, your identity. You must, in fact, stand in front of the public and God and obliterate yourself. Tar cinematographer Florian Hofmeister is our guest on this episode of The Hollywood Reporter's Behind the Screen. Todd Field's drama stars Kate Blanchett as fictional composer, conductor, and EGOT winner Lydia Tarr. The movie is in competition this week at the Energa Camera Image International Cinematography Film Festival in Turin, Poland. In this conversation, Hofmeister talks about the making of Tar and the film's visual style, which he describes as authentic, intimate observation. I'm Carolyn Giardina. Welcome to Behind the Screen. Florian, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on the film. Thanks for having me. So my first question is, what attracted you to the project? Good question. Uh, many things. First and foremost, Todd Field. I've been you know, a great uh, fan uh, of his work. And then, so, I mean, to an extent that I just consider it a privilege having had a chance to work with him. So he could have probably sent me the telephone directory of New York, and I would have said, yes, I'm up for filming that. Um, but he also sent me the script. And I was just, you know, it was such an intriguing, yeah, like almost like a little uh, trip, like an, a voyage. She, the, the script just kind of started and you found yourself in this world that I didn't know anything about, you know, uh, a very uh, uh, niche world, you know, for lack of better words, of classical music. Um, and you would just find yourself in the midst of it and you would keep on reading and keep on reading and it just drew you in and it, it, it seemed to have a underlying reality that was not really part of the reading experience that just slowly, slowly got into your head. And I just tremendously loved that. And when it finally ended, then you know, the way the film ends, uh, um, that last tracking shot that was already scripted uh, with that voiceover from the video game, I thought, this is just, this is going to be a trip. And I, I would love to be part of that. Well, when you and Todd first started talking about how you were going to lens the film, what did you discuss as far as, you know, how you wanted to use the camera to tell the story? Well, I think it was apparent quite quickly that... Todd would value what was had, was was apparent in this already in, in the in the script. Uh, he would value a form of visual detachment. So camera movement, for example, had to be restricted to actors moving. You know, it was we spent a lot of time talking about restraint or a form of restraint. Um, I have this phrase for my for my own a guiding uh, line for my own work, which is like, don't put a head on a head. And he had this phrase, don't gild the lily. So both both those things, you know, appeal to our um, almost 
embedded wish to beautify things. And it was very clear here from the start that that would be the wrong option to take in terms of the visual language of Tar. You know, script was full of intimate knowledge, which would, you know, cry out for a style that would really favor authenticity of space. That was really crucial. You know, if you want to create a world that feels so real that it's immersive, the visuality has to um, be authentic in the first, first place. But then also there in the script and in, in, in the many conversations we had, Todd would uh, really emphasize um, an idea of observation. For example, in the big concert hall for all the rehearsals, you know, he was very adamant um, that um, it should feel like a workspace. We didn't want to uh, romanticize music, which is, you know, your first instinct. I mean, if you're standing in that concert hall and you have, a, you know, a, a full symphony orchestra playing the first two bars of Mahler, you know, the cinematographer's heart wants to fly away. You know, you want to go, oh, and do a great move. And it was very clear that those would have been the wrong choices. It was all about restraint, you know, um, about less. We talked a lot about less. The less is more, and even more less can be even more more. So um, that was actually how we approached it, a form of to find a tone of authentic, intimate observation. Now, I know that um, before you started production, you did a lot of testing. Would you talk about that process and um, what led you to choose your camera and lens systems? Yeah, testing is quite dear to me personally as a cinematographer. It's a um, it's a great practical entry point. You know, in the normal course of pre-production, especially on this film, you know, where we shot so much on location, uh, uh, even though sometimes it was built, it was would be built in a location. So basically, you jump in the car, you know, and spend two months just driving around and uh, uh, looking at places. And a lot of these conversations are casual, you know, even the ones where you try to narrow down the film, something sometimes happen, you know, in those cars, traveling, looking at places. So um, a first test is really a marking point for me to open a kind of a creative space in which I can start to resonate with the director without words. So normally my first step would always be to shoot a test choose some lenses that I would feel would resonate with what Todd had talked about or what we had discussed. You know, I would get uh, a stand in any costume, you know, choose a location, hopefully, that was would somehow resonate with the film. And then I would go out there and shoot for a day just by myself. And I would always, you know, of course, Todd was more than invited to come, but he was just busy, in which very much plays into my concept that, when you then go and watch that for the first time together, I literally can show something that I've made and that is a benchmark to really feel, are we actually talking about the right things? Or do we think of the same things when we, when we exchange the same words? And um, that is, of course, uh, at the beginning, practically based on cameras and lenses, but in a more intuitive and artistic way, it's basically seeing each other's vision within the material that I sketched up. And that was very successful in, uh, um, in, in the first step. And uh, it was also, it's also very important for me then to hear the uh, reaction, the director's reaction and taught really, um, read, uh, you know, corresponded really beautifully. He is a very, very sensitive eye, you know, and, uh, we would look at this glass and he, he coined this phrase, which I really love. Some of the stuff looked just amazingly beautiful. And he would say, yeah, that looks beautiful, but that looks like a movie with a capital M. That's not what we want to do. So th that process is a very beautiful process in terms of, you know, getting your bearings right and almost tuning the instruments. And then you would walk away from that. And I would do another test where I would refine, um, you know, you would, leave out some of the stuff that we disregarded as not appropriate and then we you would refine um the lenses and the camera and then um there were other things that i would test for example there in the film we had this thing which we which we called the uh the march of tar because lydia tar is always moving 
and there were all these lateral moving shots. So I set up, you know, in the production office in a long corridor, I set up some track and we would really try to find the lens. We find, try to find the speed because Todd had a certain um, uh, uh, beats per second rate in his mind that would correspond with some of the, the compositions that Hilda was doing. So it's like these things, you just try to get more practical, more practical and shape it down. And in the end, um, in terms of the technicalities of it, we, we found a lens system that we kind of liked, but fortunately, when before Todd had come to Europe, he had shot uh, one little lens test in New York, and he had taken this really <laughs> obscure piece of glass off some shelf somewhere. And I was not part of that because I couldn't travel to the US at this point. I would just watch it remotely. And I and at that point, I actually didn't know him at all, but I just said very openly, I think this, this whatever shot that is, whatever that was taken, that to me feels like the film you're about to make. And it became apparent that that was one of his favorite uh, lenses. And so we had something we were chasing and we, in the end, we settled on a glass that was a bit more dependable than this very old lens. Um, and we had it actually hand tuned by a lens technician in Berlin. And we kind of built our own little variation of this. They were basically, they were the, based on the Airy signature primes, you know, we developed uh, a kind of a hand tuned uh, version of that. And uh, they were all spherical lenses. We shot the film spherical in um, 2.4 aspect ratio. You know. And with Airy cameras as well. And we shot it with every cameras. Yes, we captured digitally. We shot a, vari uh, a variety of uh, every 65, also the LF. We shot large format, but also a lot of super 35 format. You touched on this, but the uh, th the way you use the camera to follow Lydia's movements, um, you have a lot of long shots. And I, I'll use one that I thought was quite notable, the scene in at, when she's teaching at Juilliard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it's a it's a lovely scene. It's a lovely scene, and and actually, it's probably one of the scenes that we spoke about most. A couple of these reasons, for for technical reasons, and some of it though was more of philosophical nature because Todd was very adamant from the start there should be a, a single shot, but not for the reason of you know being you know showing off or following somebody. What the the thought behind it was if you had broken down the scene in its individual parts, at least you were to shoot it with multiple setups, we would have ended up with something like 35 shots. And the idea was that with a camera, we would reach those different um, angles to do these, you know, the very, the uh, individual moment of the scene justice, but the editorial tempo, you know, the lock, the basically that what would drive it was what was Kate's performance. So in essence, you know, um, in essence, you give her the editorial power over that sequence. And, you know, an audience might come back not even realizing that it was a single shot endeavor. That would be the, the ideal. And what I've noticed a couple of times, some people actually feel that the opening scene at um, uh, the Alice Tully Hall with uh, Adam Gopnik, right. that that feels like a continuous shot and that Juliet's people don't even realize that it's a continuous camera move, you know? So I, I think that's actually quite telling for the, for the uh, underlying processes that happen when the film is running, because when you start at Alice Tully Hall and even it happens to me, even though I've seen the film, you know, I've graded it and I've seen it, you know, numerous times the way that it's being constructed, it feels so immersive and real that I actually do think after two minutes, I'm actually at this place and I'm watching the interview, you know, because there's such confidence to it in which, in which it is just displayed. It's just what it is. And then when you come, uh, so I, I would actually, I totally, uh, I could totally relate to people who think, oh, that's continuous. And then when you come to Juliet, you then have a feeling where, you know, she is marching through those key moments of that sequence. And I, I'm really proud of it because technically it was also very challenging. That was the second part of the discussion because it was a very, it was a, uh, it's a, a little theater, you know, it's a theater in a, in, in a gallery um, 
um, in, in Germany, uh, very modern buildings. Basically, it's all uh, stone walls. It's like, you know, there's no, there's only one way in and one way out. We, we considered bringing in the crane, but that, you know, that was too complicated technically. Then we thought of rigging something to hang something off the ceiling. Didn't work. Then we wanted to bring in a special piece of gear from the UK, which is this stabilized camera head, but there's only four of them in the world and they weren't available. So it was just a really lengthy process to get us to this point. Then we finally, we built this uh, like a little rig ourselves and had these grips carry it. And so we had to do a rehearsal day uh, technically. Then we did a full rehearsal day with Kate. And then finally we started shooting. And I still remember the very first take was absolutely perfect. And it was so unbelievably perfect because, you know, when you do these things, of course, we are all thinking like half of our brain is going, this is insane. You know, this is really insane. It's 10 minutes, you know, a good third into the film. I mean, that's a real, you know, that's a real commitment. And um, you think, are we actually going to be able to pull it off? So we did the first take. She sits down, she plays the piano for real. I mean, you know, there were so many crazy elements in this sequence. And just at the very end, we slipped technically. And I was thinking, oh God, you know, I was just, it was almost <laughs> like in a film. It literally the last 15 seconds and we slip. So we had to go again, but you know, you really, I really, um, it's, I really want to say what a privilege it is or was to work with Todd and Kate in that particular instance, because they just move on. They, you know, there's nobody to blame. Be committed to this going to go and she, you know we went another 12 times to finally get everything right and it, and then it worked and of course that was tremendously pleasing okay this was the rig built by the uh, camera grips and it consisted at its heart it consists of a ronin stabilized camera head and then we just build a truss and and they would walk around and pass it along so it was a big dance basically you know because you had to go up the stage down the stage and um, it was a dance of many people. Describe the dance. What what was the crew doing while they were passing this? Well, it's it's, it's very simple. If you if wherever we wanted the camera to go, people had to hand carry it. So people would pass it from the stage down into the auditorium. They would carry it up through the you know the uh, the seats. You know, and 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 of course, once you devise a, a strategy to to travel not lateral but maybe in a diagonal. Uh, you just, you know, you have to pass this rig on from one grip to another and it has to be, you know, fluid. So, um, and at the meantime, you have, because we couldn't hide, we would actually hide up in the galleries in these uh, translator booths. And then you had the focus puller on socks running after the camera and a boom up, trying not to get filmed. So um, it's really a dance. It's really a dance. <laughs> and, you know, there's something what's so touching and beautiful about it is that, you have all these grown-up men who walk on socks. And, uh, you know, whilst you have this amazing actress immersing herself in this, in this performance, and I thought there's, there's just something, you know, because a lot of people think about some elements of filmmaking as a very muscular activity. You know, we've got these cranes and the big lights, and, you know, wherever we go, we push everything aside and we block roads. But in essence, you might just have, you know, four 40 year old guys walking on socks, you know, quietly after somebody who's philosophizing about music. So, you know, there you go. Well, Kate is, again, extraordinary in this role. Would you elaborate on the way you use the camera across really the whole film to show her journey? First of all, of course, it, it's it, it, what I find interesting you said, again, amazing. And that's in itself already a statement because that was my expectation, of course. You should shooting a film with um, Kate uh, Blanchett. And of course you think she will be amazing. And then again, she's amazing. <laughs> but now, this time though, I think she was just beyond amazing, you know, because she had to learn German. Uh, she had to learn how to play the piano. She learned how to conduct. It was just on every, every day was just full of, remarkable achievements and that really sets the tone also for everybody else which i thought was really interesting as an experience because everybody then really tries to reach 
in their own departments for that for that level of um, devotion. In terms of, I had one little, you know, we spoke a lot about lighting, uh, Todd and I, and uh, I thought if you look at the, especially at the beginning of the film, there's a clear, the, the way I saw or we distinguished is you have these moments where she appears, you know, for example, she, you know, the first interview with Adam Gottman gives an appearance in front of a thousand people. But I personally felt as well that, uh, you know, her dinner with, uh, or her lunch with Elliot Kaplan is an audience, is an appearance in front of an audience of one. You know, she, she has these uh, elements where she keeps her cards closed or, or where she also exists in the realm of a, a narration of herself, as we all do. So I think there was a, a way to distinguish that by keying her very strongly and making her appear, so to say, you know, with a very strong key light um, in in her most uh, glorious way. And then in those moments of anxiety um, or doubt, or, or also in moments of pure creativity, when she's in her studio apartment, uh, we try to keep this light really soft, more like an open shadow, very intimate. You know, so those were two elements that, Follow, you can see actually through the film how they develop. And interestingly, the one scene, which I find still one of the uh, most touching ones, because it's very unexpected, is that little book reading she has to do. Because there, if you look closely, you'll see she appears in front of an audience, but there's no light anymore. And she is, it, as it's, is at her most frailest, you know, and, and, uh, uh, very transparent, um, and, um, taught, uh, always used to say, oh, that has to feel like somebody's going to have surgery. You know, so in a way, the lighting there has left her and she's just what, what she is, you know, but this time in front of an audience. And then would you describe how you shot the ending? Oh, the ending. <laughs> <laughs> the ending takes place in a nondescript place in Southeast Asia where um, Ta has basically found a new position as a conductor She's conducting this orchestra as a, 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 to me, it felt like a, a one-time gig, but, um, and it's actually a concert that, uh, where an orchestra accompanies uh, a presentation of a video game. And this last shot is basically this long tracking shot along the audience that is listening to her conducting. Normally, you try not to shoot the beginning or the end at the end of the film. You know, you try to, to schedule those things in the middle when everybody is at their peak. Just due to the nature of this, we had to shoot the last, you know, her, her trip into Southeast Asia at the end of our shoot. And the very last shot of the film was indeed the very last shot of our production. And we had already finished with Kate. She had already gone and I think she had to fly out immediately. So she came down and sat next to us while we set up this amazing tracking shot. It was scripted, you know, and it was a big crane uh, that these uh, Thai grips had, I don't know, pushed into, built overnight into this room. I mean, the entire to process took two days. We had set up the crane in a parking lot to really make sure that it was a lateral traveling at a certain speech that would last for the duration of this voiceover that Todd had written. So everything was planned to the very extent. We filled that uh, theater with all these amazing kits in these amazing costumes. And then we started, you know, trying to achieve the shot, which is, um, you know, it looks very easy, but it's, you know, you really have to hit the timing right so that you don't go too fast. So you still see him, but you have to go fast enough to end the shot in time. So it was an, uh, quite a process. And Kate had come down, was sitting next to us. We were going one more, two more, three more. It was it, it was late. The air was really thin. People were the extras were falling asleep at times. And Ted was Todd was saying, "No, they have to keep their eyes open. So we have to go again, again, again." Finally, we achieve it, and it's the last shot of the film. And I cannot tell you, it was the the feeling, the, the greatest feeling of relief of having accomplished this really complicated long trip. So we all start jubilating, we jump and down. And, and, and I remember that because Todd was at this point was on the stage and I was quite far away from him. So I ran up on the stage, we finally see each other and we fall into each other's arms. And, and that's why I tell the story, you know, because we fell into each other's arms, because by chance, the, the, the all the extras were still in the room. 
then didn't have a clue. They didn't even know us. But suddenly, all of them jumped up and applauded. That was the <laughs> most surreal situation and the perfect way to end the film. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I have to say about the ending. <laughs> it was really remarkable. It was a beautiful moment. Well, the film is in the main competition at Camera Image. Congratulations on that. What do you enjoy the most about that cinematography festival? It's a beautiful way to watch films because they're just in the center of the attention. And, you know, they've, it's, they've got this gigantic, beautiful theater in which you can literally just walk in, sit down and watch a film. You can do it three times a day. And there's a sense um, of uh, real excitement about you know, the visual language of pieces and a real interest in it. So um, I think it's it's also an achievement. I think there, the festival is a very crucial part in reinstalling a sense of awareness of the what what the work of the cinematographers actually is, you know. And I think it's, it has really, a really enabled another de- a conversation with the audience about what we do. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about the film and your work, and congratulations again. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me.